Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. It's a really good turnout, which uh, is uh, we're getting to the uh, the point here in the event. The information we're going to give tonight is, is really important for all our safety and and because it's a um, a new method of communications, um, we just need to get our head around it. So um, I'm just going to start with a couple of things. Um, with, uh, we've got, as you know, we've organised a container. Um, this container will be able to uh, put your, your bits and pieces, your sails and dinghies and whatever, um, on the first Sunday, the, uh, Saturday the first and Sunday the second. We're going to open receivers up from nine till three o'clock each day, and there'll be some people there collect, collecting names, um, what the equipment is. We'll have a run sheet. With, what you're you're uh, you're giving us, so we don't run off with it. Um, we can uh, receive stuff outside those times, but you'll have to call myself or Tor to set it up. We we really just want to uh, nail it down to the two days, um, and on the Sunday we're going to pack it. Our esteemed Commodore is going to uh, look after that. Here you can squeeze stuff into small places. Um, we'll take anything. Um, the rates, we've, we've set the rates, um, but it's based on recovery, cost recovery. Uh, the container costs about 7000 up and back, um, which uh, the, the inquiries have had so far, we just won't, won't have a problem doing it. Just a couple of things with the container. Um, fuel containers, empty, outboard's empty. If it's a heavy item, you need to have it Somehow we can move around with a trolley. Um, we'll possibly steal a, a barrel or two from here and have them in the container for um, the other end to make it easier. Um, sails, they can be, uh, they, they don't have to be bagged, they can be, when they can be uh, sausage bags with batons in them and stuff because we'll just lay them on the ground. Um, but you'll be charged for space and weight. Um, we've got a $10 a crew bag um, and it goes up from there. Um, really, that's about it. Um, just, uh, oh yeah, just payment. We haven't 100% nailed down the payment yet, but we, there'll be credit card cash for on your club account. Um, the, uh, the mechanics of how we actually do it now, uh, we're still working on. Um, and if you've got anything fragile, it goes fragile to go in there. You just make sure it's boxed up, boxed up properly. Um, insurance, we, we're still working on that. Um, it may be, a, uh, it probably won't be an issue for the way up, but on the way back with the race sales, there's going to be a substantial amount of money tied up in them, so we have to get that right. Um, we're looking at a couple of avenues. We can get transport insurance from the transport company, um, but we just, so there may be the, the, the numbers I uh, estimated is going to cost you maybe up a couple of bucks. That bit all to, to cover that. Um, I'd just like to hand over to to Tor, who's going to just he's got a couple of things to talk about, and um, then we're going to do a short short video, and then eight minutes, and then we'll go to uh, Cam's presentation. Thanks, Mikey. Um, just on what Mikey was saying, so if anyone's shipped anything overseas, just treat it like a carne. So we will need tags, everything needs to be labelled, um, just to really try and facilitate it. So even if uh, the boats, you, you organise how many bags and bits and pieces, just anything we can do to try to make it a little bit simpler, uh, packing and stuff like that and, and back then. But um, just uh, aside from the container side of things, if just for the people that are doing the X-Mouth event, we've been going through and doing a bit of a, an audit from our side of things about where everyone is at, the 38 boats now, um, in terms of their documentation, qualifying passages and, and various bits and pieces. So we will start communicating um, possibly as early as tomorrow um, with the, the vast majority of the boats, just where we understand you're at. There are some boats that are, uh, pretty well 100% um, ticked off, and there's some that have got a little bit of work to do. But we just want to open up the dialogue with all the boats, just to make sure that we both understand where everyone is at. And I'll uh, put, my, put my hand up now, that if, uh, if you have emailed me uh, documents, 
then it might be a little bit challenging because we are trying to get everyone to put their documents on top yacht. So if we're asking you for the same document again, uh, please forgive me, it's been a, quite a busy couple of months, so, but we'll work through with, with you to, to get it all done and get you across the line. Um, so in the, in the spirit, uh, we're moving away from that, so in the spirit of uh, tonight's event, uh, we've been fortunate enough that one of our fellow club members, Lou Parkinson, has uh, kindly come forward and um, uh, recorded a video. Uh, for those of you that don't know Luke Parkinson, he's uh, a bit of a sailing guru, comes from a good lineage clearly of, uh, of sailors. A uh, couple of America's Cup under his belt, a couple of Volvo Ocean races, uh, couldn't tell you how many Hobarts and kill boat, big boat, kill boat sort of things. Um, but as part of that, he's done an incredible amount of training and also uh, he's at the cutting edge in terms of safety side of things. Um, and he's got quite a vast array on his CV in terms of uh, round the world races to boats that do literally 100 kilometers an hour. So he's pretty well up there. He's done a short video just on some, um, which is specific to this sort of type of, this event, and just runs through some of the, his sort of check boxes from his approach and his personal sort of experiences and, and reflections on that. So. Um, Obviously, a big thank you to Luke for taking the time to, to do this. Hi, everyone. Here from Bermuda. We are currently uh, sitting in hotel rooms waiting to get out in the water and trying to go racing still for Sail GB. But um, anyway, tonight's about safety, and that's a yeah, big topic. So I thought I'd share a little video on a couple of couple of the tips that I sort of go by before going offshore. Um, a big one I really wanted to start with was about everyone's personal safety gear, um, which everyone's going to use individually throughout the trip to go north. Um, one of the key points with personal safety gear is just knowing how it works and being really comfortable with it. Um, you've got to be comfortable wearing it while you're out there. If it's not comfortable, there's so many different brands for life jackets and tethers and bum bags and things like that. Just make sure you try another brand. Um, otherwise, you, know, you just don't end up wearing it and the risks of being out there are much higher. Um, okay, so the basically all the personal safety gear that you wear, you know, your life jacket, your bum bag, all that sort of stuff. Um, some of it may come with a boat that you sail on, but ultimately it's your own responsibility to know how it works, if it's going to work for you, if it actually fits. Um, so make sure whichever boat you're on, or if you own a boat, that your crew is um, on top of that and that they're comfortable before you get going. Um, so the four big ticket personal items that um, I feel strongest about is number one, it's got to be AIS. That's the one thing in my mind, um, if you go over the side, it's the easiest way for your own boat and your other competitors, other fishing boats, anyone who's out there, gonna, you know, they're going to see that alarm come up on their chart plotter and um, basically it's the quickest and most effective way uh, for raising an alarm and it's going to massively increase your chance of being picked up. So with that AIS beacon, quite often a lot of people put it in their bum bag, some people have it in their life jacket. Um, for me, well you just got to work out what works for you, but for me personally I like to put it in my wet weather pants because um, they're the first thing I put on. It means I have it on me most of the time. Um, if you do put it in your pants, make sure there's a little tab in there, make sure you tie it on. Um, so it does, if it does fall out, you don't lose it over the side. And if you are in the water, that bit of string is long enough to actually go above the water, so you can still use that. Um, equally, if you like to wear a jacket, you probably put it in your jacket pocket and um, you could do something like that if you, if you like. The next piece of personal safety equipment I highly go by is the, just a headlight or a small waterproof torch. Um, try and have your, this on you at all times after dark. If you fall over the side, it's so quick to activate. It's really easy to see. Um, and it may also help you to activate another piece of safety equipment, PLB or AIS beacon that you're having trouble with. Um, so yeah, they're just, they're just such a key piece of equipment for me. Uh, number three is gonna be a life jacket. There's so many uncomfortable ones out there. Um, it's really annoying if you haven't fitted the straps before you get, you know, into into the night. You've really got to spend a little bit of time, make it comfortable, make sure it's one that you're actually going to wear. Um, you know, you want to know if it's automatic, if it's manual.
manual, all those sorts of things, check the light is actually working and um, you know some of them these days have the automatic AOS uh, deployment. When they come in, quite often they have a little plastic bracket on them to, um, to be allowed to freight or to travel. Make sure this little bracket is off so that when the life jacket actually inflates, your AIS actually deploys and it's doing what it's meant to do. It's really easy, just it's one of the checks that you have to do. And then my fourth piece of personal safety gear that I really go by is my tether. Um, again, there's so many brands out there and you've just got to find one that works. Some are really fiddly and quite annoying, um, but just make sure you practice a little bit. You can use it with cold hands in the dark, that sort of thing. Um, little trick that a lot of people probably know, but your tether, um, they can flap around and be pretty annoying, but if you clip on one side, pass it around back, clip it back on the front, takes up most of the length and it doesn't really get in the way. Um, for me, I personally like the ones with the shock cord on the inside, um, again, personal thing, just becomes less of a hindrance and more inclined to use it. Um, Alright, so there's basically the big ticket personal items for me, but there's also other things you're going to have to carry um, to be, you know, rules capable of the race sort of thing. Um, like your e bum bag, all those sorts of things, they're all equally important as the other things I've mentioned. Um, but you're just going to have to figure out ways that they work for you and how you can carry them and so they don't get in the way. Um, you just got to be comfortable. If you're not comfortable, you tend not to use them or have them on you. So, you know, then your risk increases and that basically lies on your own back. Um, Alright, so the, the boat also has a lot of other safety gear for these sorts of races. Um, hopefully you don't ever really use it. So, that, you know, things like life rafts, the boat seeker, grab bags, those sorts of things. Make sure that half the crew sort of know how it all works. You know, you can offload different responsibilities to different people or different equipment. Um, but basically, the people who have done the sea survival course should sort of lead this a little bit and help the other people to understand it if they want to. Um, even if everyone doesn't completely understand how all the equipment works, everyone should know where all the equipment is. So if you have to get it, you can get it quite quickly. Um, for all the guys who are packing the boat, or you might own one of the boats, um, spend a bit of time to actually think about where the gear goes. Try not to just store it out of the way because um, it's you know taking up the least space, or it's the best riding moment, or something like that. Um, actually, think about where you should try and put it to be able to access it if you need it um, in the appropriate way, because you can sort of get tra trapped out like that as well. Um, I also like to do a couple of small little things like laminating key information um, and sticking around the nav station just in case someone has to step in, help out, do a role they're not familiar with, you know, things when it's rough to quickly, you know, find a race radio channel or sport, um, the boat call sign, emergency channels, even skid timings can be pretty handy when it's not great weather. Um, just things you might think would be helpful if someone had to step into that role but doesn't normally do it. Um, Another really good little safety one is just checking the, the gear on the back of your boat, you know, making sure for a man overboard situation you're actually prepared. Do you have a small hatch or a grab bag nearby that's sort of suitable to stow there permanently um, to be ready to put into action with, you know, your floating torch, glow sticks and the other immediate response gear, um, the throwing rope and things like that. Um, if you haven't done a man overboard drill, at least chat about it with your crew and take a while to sort of think about and refresh in the minds of everyone in the process. Um, if you chat about it, it's not quite as daunting when you actually have to do it. I've done a few drills where we've been offshore, we've actually lost, we've spent many hours, we've actually lost the inflatable mark that we've dropped over the side and haven't been able to recover it. But every time we've done that, we've learned something that's been pretty key to getting someone back when I've actually had to use the skills, um, which I hope no one ever has to, has to do, because it's an awful experience. Um, they say for every 100,000 miles that someone sails, um, you'll experience at least one man overboard, which is a pretty, um, it's a heavy fact, but I, I actually believe in it. Um, so lastly, before you motor out, try and have a bit of a team briefing on the day of the start, um, you know, this it could be even the night before if you're if you're rushing to um, to get to the start the next day, or if you don't have enough time for work or whatever commitments. But um, nominate someone to do this sort of briefing. You know, it doesn't have to take that long. It can be a little bit of a settler, and um, you know, you, you've normally got time on the way out there. You need a normal briefing on the way out to the race course. Um, someone should be talking about the conditions of the start. Know, try and actually make time where everyone comes back 
also a bit of be a little bit of information, doesn't have to be long, just a brief, you know, whether any navigational difficulties you're going to go past, just highlight those sorts of things. Um, and then lastly, nominate someone for a little safety chat. The segment might only be, you know, five or so minutes, but it just helps to refresh everyone's mind where the certain things are in the boat and can help, you know, people become more comfortable. So in that safety briefing, just include the big items, you know, life raft, the curb crab bag, where they are. John boys, Dan boys, which one of those your team sort of prefers to, or light bring, um, which one of those you is your preferred method amongst your own crew. Um, and then just a quick man overboard basic plan. You know, if you have an MOB button, where is it and how does it work? Um, your first response actions. Um, talk about your default processes if you have like a spinnaker up, um, how you're going to drop the sail getting the sheets in and then, you know, backup plan in some ways, like what if you lose your bowman, who's going to sort of step into that role? And then just reminding everyone not to rush for the engine. Big one, people quite often get the ropes around the propeller in a big frenzy. Um, boat becomes even harder to manoeuvre and then in turn the person in the water suffers and the rest of the team are at risk. So, you know, just by talking about these things on your way out to the start can, you know, increase people's comfort feeling um, and on the back of the boat you should also highlight at the same time in this briefing highlight you know those those quick response things like the, thro like the throwing floating torch glow sticks and those sorts of things um, lastly with your safety chat just as you finish off um, try and remind everyone about their own personal gear they're responsible of wearing it um, and also the race regulations that make you wear it at certain times so everyone then feels obligated to wear it and um, more responsible within themselves. So I hope that helps with everyone's preparation. So if it was a little bit rushed um, for the upcoming race trip north, I hope everyone has a great time. I wish I could be out there with you guys. I just missed it because I'll be in quarantine in Perth. But um, I'll be watching the tracker and I hope everyone has a safe trip. See you soon, guys. That was uh, super informative. Um, just with the man overboard drill, we, we actually do, Fremont Sailing Cup does have a dummy, um, which is around somewhere. Os he's called Oscar. Right? Um, yeah, not a Commodore, no. Um, and it's a life size, um, similar weight to some of us. Um, and it's, it's here for us to use. So it saves putting uh, somebody in the water at risk. Yeah, like you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just before we go into Cam's talk, I just behind the scenes there's a hell of a lot of work being done, which people know about. But um, one of the really important documents for this event is to keep us all safe is a risk management document. This thing's um, morphed over the years. It, it, it's uh, we've plagiarised it. It's been swapped around the yacht clubs, but. Um, for this, this event, it, it, actually we had it for Bali as well, um, but it's because of the change of the uh, from Cat 1 to Cat 2 and a few other subtle changes with rules. Um, it's been uh, rejigged again, and Ian over here, very quiet, he's put hundreds of hours, I would suggest, weeks and weeks of work into it, um, leading the team um, to, to make it happen. And it's it's Without that document, um, the club's at risk, we're at risk. Um, that's a pretty boring read, but, but it's something we have to have. So um, now we'll just go over to Cam. Cam's going to give us a bit of talk on this communications. Um, at the end of it, the, if you've got some questions, um, fire them, as long as they're not too long. Um, but maybe if they're a long question, keep it at the, the end. Um, if we need to need to uh, spread some more information out. If there's some specific questions people have that we can't answer at this point, we'll answer them down the track. All of this information will be on the website. Um, Cam's notes, this video, um, the video has been taken now, so you can revisit it if you need to. Cam? 
Uh, thanks very much, Mike. And um, Mike's um, touched on the risk management document. Um, I'm actually going to start with that tonight. Um, this presentation that I'm going to give tonight is more fundamental than technical. Um, we, in terms of getting back to risk assessment, we can't assume that everyone here has a complete grasp on all the communications options available, the communications options we're using, and the communications devices related to uh, emergency situations and safety. So in, in that vein, as I go through this, some of this stuff is gonna be really fundamental, maybe a little bit boring, but um, we want, I want you to sort of approach it with a beginner's mind type um, type deal where if you know something, that's okay, but maybe there's something you don't know. And uh, in fact, there's something that occurred when I was doing this uh, presentation and doing some testing that I didn't know, and it was a fundamental thing, and I'll bring it up later. But yeah, so I hope some of you are gonna be really experienced, some of you not so much. This is a broad view. Um, you can take this document home, as Michael said, it'll be available online, and the idea is to go through it, read it, work out what you need to know um, relating to, to the items in here. Um, so with the, with the risk management document, um, I actually wrote some notes uh, and my first, um, first few slides here um, are um, pertaining to that. But uh, the newsletter that came out yesterday that Bernie Carx wrote, um, Bernie's section on safety is actually a really, really good articulate uh, description of, of this area of the presentation. So I'm actually going to steal that and I'm just going to read it to you now. Okay, so Bernie writes, safety. This is the part that nobody really wants to read because we are wired to be optimistic enough to believe that it could never happen to us. The fact is, of course, that it can and it is a fundamental job of the Fremantle Sailing Club to prepare itself for any eventuality. To that extent, the club has alerted all statutory authorities to the race, uh, of the race and its race management strategy. All sea rescue units along the coast know that 40 odd yachts will be sailing to Exmouth. There is a dedicated risk management plan in place um, in the event of a serious incident on the water. We see a trained emergency management group swing into action. The group will take charge of the emergency in concert with AMSA and the water police while allowing the race management team to get on with the job of taking care of the rest of the fleet. An illustration of the seriousness attached to this subject, the entire race management group and the incident management team will meet for a scenario study lasting several hours aimed at identifying any weaknesses that may exist in the plans. The knowledge gained, gained in, on the exercise will hopefully never be required uh, but as the scouting movement has made clear, it pays to be prepared. So um, I hope everyone understands that. As Mike said, we have uh, a very large risk assessment document that Ian Whitehead has worked so feverishly on. The um, risk assessment document points to the need for what's known as the EMH, or the Emergency Management Handbook, which is this. It's some 50 odd pages. This is all the information um, that the uh, IMT, the incident management team, which is, which is named in this document, use uh, should there be an emergency situation, which leaves the race officers and, the, and race control to actually run the race. So yeah, thanks uh, Ian and, and Mike Walker and Tor for all the work, uh, work on that. So moving on to uh, actual communications. I'm just going to go past my risk management because I've just gone through that. So broadly speaking, uh, if we look at our top line here, uh, we're just looking at the, the communications and safety devices that you're going to have on board. So you're going to have your SAP phone. It's going to be your primary um, method of doing SCEDs. It'll be used in emergencies if it needs to. It will have data and email uh, available and it can give you weather. It will give you weather because uh, that, that's part of the notice of race. That needs to, to be something that works on your boat. VHF, uh, voice comms. Um, obviously, we're all fairly familiar with that. Uh, emergency DSC and ship to ship DSC. That's one of the things that I'm gonna spend some time on tonight rather than just going over it. That's, that's a very important part of this presentation and of the race. 
AIS, uh, Collision Avoidance, Position Info, MOB Location, and it's actually also a very important backup to the YV trackers for race control. PLV EPIRP, um, SAR notification and SAR location is what those devices are used for. We'll be going through these in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, YB Tracker, used to be called Yellow Brick Tracker, it's now YB Tracker. Um, position information, that's our main tracking for the race. Uh, we're also going to be using it for messaging this year, uh, which I'll go through later in, in the presentation. HF radio, some of the boats will have HF. Uh, long distance communications is what it's used for mostly. Um, AMSA and the WA Police through Coast Radio Perth monitor the HF emergency frequencies 24-7. It has an emergency DSC function. It's also very handy for getting the weather free of charge. Um, the other one in here, which may not be thought about too much, is your mobile phone. Um, it uh, provides voice and data within, within range of, uh, of a network weather and navigation, um, but a lot of you are going to be using Iridium GOES and your phone will be the device that you use with that uh, Iridium GO device, so it's going to be very important. So there are communications uh, and emergency options and uh, mandatory, some of them. Um, support agency, so Fremantle Race Control is a support agency to you through the, uh, through the race control, the race officers and the incident management team should it be activated which hopefully it won't. Um, nearby vessels are, are a support to you uh, through AIS, through VHF and through SAP phone. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. AMSA. AMSA is a big one. It's probably the biggest, the biggest thing here. Um, it's the primary search and rescue agency and it activates all the other agencies, WA Police, Aircraft, Merchant Ships. VMR, etc. And I've just got those two at the end there, uh, West, West Australian Police and VMR. So I just want to touch on um, AMSA in a bit more detail. Um, two Wednesdays ago, um, Ian Whitehead organised a, a meeting with, uh, with our um, AMSA representative. Should have got this card out before. His name's Paul Zagezi. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to go down to AMSA and spent uh, quite a bit of time with Paul um, going through our plans and looking at um, what they do and how they see things. Um, and I must say that it, with all the work that we've been doing on this, um, there was a great sort of feeling of relief from all of us when we were able to talk it through actually in the office and see what they see in terms of seeing you guys. So Paul at his desk has a, a very big monitor on the left, uh, on that monitor, he has a very detailed AIS charts, which are layered with different different layers. He's got commercial vessels, he's got active um, vessels that they're watching, uh, plus all of their air assets, which which they can mobilise. Uh, the screen next to that uh, is very interesting. It has a top uh, top section, which is, for example, EPIRBs that are going off right now, and there was quite a lot of them, probably 15 or more. Um, the next um, section was uh, active incidents which are being worked on at the time at the moment and the third one was all the, all of the information they had on um, for example us so when we register all of the boats with AMSA that's what they will see they will see the uh, FSC Exmouth race as, a, as a, a target call it on their screen and inside the button there is all of the information that we provide them, which is everyone's hex IDs, MMSIs, etc., etc. Um, we were able to present to them our communications plan, um, which they were very happy with. They didn't make any changes to it. They were very comfortable with that. We got to ask them some questions, which I'm going to relate to in a minute. Um, so, yeah, very comfortable knowing that that's what's happening in the background as you guys are sailing up north, that um, they're, they're literally watching you. They're using yellow brick as well. Um, so, so very comforting to know that. Okay, so getting into our communications. Satellite phone, this is one of the things I'm not gonna talk very much about. We know what it is. Um, you, you probably all have them by now. Um, basically, it's a device that sends information uh, by radio frequency to a satellite, comes back down to an earth station, and then is delivered to other networks. In, in this case, it's going to be delivered to a mobile phone. 
um, for this event, uh, the communications requirements are voice, text, email and weather. Now I've just got a note here, um, the SCEDS part, we're going to be talking about that in detail, so I'm going to talk about that at the end. Okay, VHF radio, uh, pretty basic. Again, radio uses frequencies uh, 156 to 162 meg. Um, probably the most important thing here is to make sure that your radio is, is working, that it is functional. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we have handheld varieties, of course, much lower power, so you need to know the limitations of those and know when they're appropriate to use and when they're not appropriate to use. Sorry, I've just got some extra notes I need to refer to here. Okay, just getting back to the sat phones, um, just a note here I did have uh, from AMSA when we were talking to them. If you do have consistent trouble trying to get through, uh, and we'll, we'll, you'll know whether that's the case or not, AMSA's advice is that you need to change course, um, change your heading a little bit can sometimes fix the problem. Obviously, they need to be, uh, you need to have a clear view of the sky, so you may need to move around, but as you're leading up to the race, we're gonna be doing testing. You'll be able to test your sat phones and you'll be able to work out uh, the, the best way that they're gonna work. Um, okay, so the sailing instructions um, specify what channels to be listening on. Um, we've put in there uh, specifically about repeaters. I'll be getting to that later. Um, but the most important thing fundamentally, again, fundamental information is you need to always be scanning the appropriate channels and you need to always be listening in case someone's trying to get through to you. It could be someone from the fleet, it could be sea rescue, it could be water police. Um, so always be listening. Um, so the next slide is about testing. So you need to test your radio before you go, you need to test it now, you need to test it a week before probably tested a couple of days before. Um, you should be able to get 5x5 five five to Rockingham from your pen here at the club. If you're not, then you've got an issue and you need to sort that out. Um, I look at lots of radios for different people and it's nearly always the antenna. Um, that is where you start if you're having problems, but you need to, uh, to make sure that your HF system is working correctly. Okay, so the repeaters, um, again, most people know how these works, but there's a couple of things I want to cover here um, which sometimes people aren't aware of and, and can, can cause problems. So the repeater is essentially, um, repeater channels are duplex channels, and what that means is that they have a transmit frequency and a receive frequency, as opposed to, say, channel 16, which is a simplex channel, sends and receives on one frequency. Um, so they operate a little bit differently, differently in that sense. And I'm just going to show do a quick demo. There's a really easy way to check if um, you're in range of a repeater because they have a, a sound that they make. Um, it's called a tail or a burst. I'm going to do it now. So hopefully this works. This is a handheld, but it usually gets to Mandra. So I'm on channel 82. Uh, if I'm not sure, if I can get to that repeater or not, I can do this test. I can hold down the PTT button. I'm going to do this in front of the microphone. Okay, so just after I let go of the button, you heard that little bit of static. That's actually the end of your transmission coming back to you on, on the same frequency. So if I do the same thing on channel 77, which is a simplex channel, there's nothing at all. Now, this, this is important when uh, you're traveling north, and if we go to the next page, okay, so we can see the repeater channels here. Um, these uh, red circles are roughly a 60 nautical mile radius, um, and you're gonna be moving through these zones. If you're too far out to see, obviously it's not gonna work, but if you're within these zones, potentially you can use these repeaters. Um, you can use them to talk to each other. Um, the police actually have control of the repeaters from some of the police stations up north, so it could be that they're um, trying to contact you as well. So, for example, if you're around the vicinity of Rat Island there, you can see that you've got Channel 82, Channel 80 and 81, um, all potentially uh, usable channels. And when the sailing instructions say to use appropriate channels, 
uh, in terms of repeaters, what it means is if you were in that area, you would be scanning 80, 82 and 81 in case someone was trying to call you. Um, if you are moving within those zones and you're not sure if channel 80 is going to work for you, you can do that simple test and find out rather than talking into the radio and trying to, to get someone to call you back. Does, does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, summarising there. So we get click, the characteristic uh, click. We, we heard. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it again yeah. for you. So this is 7.7. Seven, seven. It's a simplex channel. You're not going to hear anything, all right? I'm just going to hold down the button and then release it. Absolutely nothing. If I go to 8.2, which is Mandra, it's quite distinctive when you know it. Um, if I go to 81, which is Rotnest, I know this won't get there, but you know, how do I know? Nothing. Yeah, so it behaves like a, like a simplex channel would. Does that make, make sense? Yep. Um, one other thing with, with DSC, and this, this comes up a little bit. Um, let's, say, let's say you're in um, near Rat Island and you can, you're on 81 and you're using that repeater and it's working and there's a boat maybe five nautical miles to your right or maybe within distance and you know who it is um, and you get your hand held out and you go to 81 because you think, I'm just going to use 81 because that's the zone I'm in and they're on 81, and at their handhelds, they're probably not going to work. You're not going to be able to talk to someone five nautical miles from you on a repeater channel if you can't reach that repeater channel. Is that, is, is that clear? Yep. Yep, so I've, I've had people call me and say, why can't I run a race on channel 80? <laughs> you know, or channel 81, it just, it just won't work if you're not, not in range. What channel can you pick? You would have to go to 72 or 77 or any of the Simplex channels. So yeah, that, that would be the answer there. Okay. So Yep. Absolutely, you can. Yeah, so 16 is, is emergency. Absolutely, yep. Yeah, all of your Simplex channels will still be there. It's, it's purely just any confusion between a repeater channel that you're out of range of and a normal Simplex channel. And channel 16, yeah, it is, it is definitively emergency and calling. So you call someone on 16 and you say, let's go to channel 77 or 71 or, or whatever. Um, but that's actually a good lead into the next section, which is uh, DSC. Yep. The repeaters increase your range. So um, a repeater can get 60 nautical miles, it can sometimes get more. Okay, your, your simplex channel. 14 to 20 nautical miles. If, if you want to talk to a boat and you know that they're 60 nautical miles behind you and you know that they're in repeater range, if they're in, in for example, the range of that circle around Rat Island, there's a good chance that you'll be able to talk to them. So the repeater effectively just doubles or more the range that you can use. Does that, that make sense? I hope I'm explaining that properly. So, so how does it do it? Does, you, does a, a call from your boat go to the repeater station mm -hmm. where it transmits? Uh, That's right. It automatically repeats everything that you... Correct. Do. It retranscripts on a different frequency. Correct. That's, that's what I said at the start. And, and in your radio, when you go to channel 81, for example, it'll say DUP. That's duplex. Yeah. Remember that a channel is just a number. It could be anything. The, the, what's hiding behind that channel is a frequency. And for example, you know, channel 16 might be 156 megahertz. But channel 81 might be 157 and 160. And it's the trans, your, your transmission is being received on one frequency and there's a, 
apparatus, hardware apparatus in the radio, which then repeats it, sends it out on the other one, but they're under the same channel. So that, that's how it works. It's like analogous to a Wi-Fi extender. People have Wi-Fi extenders in their house, which do a similar thing. You, you make, anyway, so, so, sometimes your Wi-Fi might have enough range, might yep. be back, and you have an extender which picks up the signal and retransmits it. Correct. On a exactly. That's exactly right. But it's un under the same channel. So why can't we talk to the boat that's five kilometres away? Because if you, the example I gave there was a handheld. So if you're if, if you're assuming that you can talk to the person um, on 81, because you've been talking to everyone on 81, but you pick up your handheld, which is only five watts, it won't be able to reach the repeater and come back to the person on the boat close by. Like we're using a boat radio. Absolutely. Yeah, because your boat radio is 25 watts, it's going to have the power to get to that repeater station and then the repeater station comes back to whoever it is you're talking to. Um, okay, so DSC. Um, DSC is, is a really important... Um, we want it to be a really important part of this race. The, I'm just going to read you the first um, part of this for people who don't act, don't sort of know what it is. Digital Selective Calling, or DSC, is a standard for transmitting predefined messages via the medium frequency MF, high frequency and very high frequency VHF maritime radio systems. It's a core part of the global maritime distress safety system. So there's two reasons I want to bring this up. The first one is that you all have Class D GMDSS DSC radios on your boats because it's in the notice of race and you all have GPSs connected to them. Now, it's always been my belief that in a, in a rally or race type environment, when the closest people to you, as Luke said, is, is other boats, um, they're going to be the ones who are probably going to rescue you before AMSA or the water police get to you. So if you were in a Mayday situation, you can go to your VHF radio, you can lift up the distress button, which you can see there, and you can hold that button for five seconds, and that will send out your identity, your um, position, the time of your call, and the fact that it is a Mayday call. It automates the entire Mayday uh, procedure, and it sends it to all vessels in the area that can receive DSC, which is all of your boats. It's also all of the merchant um, merchant boats in the area shipping. Um, if it's within range of an AMSA, uh, a water police station will be received by them as well. That's unlikely. It's it's the, you guys that are going to receive this call if, uh, if one of you presses this button. Um, you would use this in combination with your EPIRB. Um, I put this question, this notion, to Paul at AMSA and he absolutely 100% agreed. Um, yes, when your EPIRB goes off, they will come looking for you, but it is, it is this that is most likely to get the attention of boats in your area. Now, um, culturally, if I can put it that way, I think in Western Australia there isn't a, a, a sound knowledge of DSC. Um, I don't know if uh, everyone knows what to do if the alarm goes off, but that's one of the one of the things we're trying to resolve tonight. So, so the DSC, um, the emergency DSC part is very important, and a way that you can get used to understanding that and how under, understanding how DSC works um, is quick to do. Question, sorry, to interrupt. Quick question: Is that DSC? E for Echo or DSC? DSC for Charlie. And what, and what, does, what does those three Digital use? Selective Call. Thank you. So it's digital information, it's data, it's selective, you can select who it goes to, and it's a call. Um, so as I said, you all have these. Um, it's just a matter of learning how to use them, use them, which isn't difficult. Now, a good way to learn how to use them is to start doing individual calls to each other. It's not just for emergencies. It's probably more useful in everyday use, just for calling each other. So, for example, uh, if I have my boat, I've got my uh, DSC radio and Ian, where's Ian? Ian's there. So Ian, I know him, I have his MMSI number, he has my MMSI number. I put his MMSI number into my radio, it goes into an address book. Um, if I want to call Ian and know that he's going to get my call, rather than just calling for fourth dimension over the air, I can call him up on here, 
Uh, I press a couple of buttons. The alarm on Ian's radio will start beeping very, very loudly for a couple of minutes. Ian will know that he's receiving an individual call. He'll know it's important. And he can go and answer that call. Now, when I made the call, I would have selected what channel I want to talk to him on. And let's say it was 77. When Ian acknowledges that call, his radio will switch to 77. Mine will switch to 77 and we can start talking. So there's lots of advantages to this. Um, as I said, the, um, the receiving radio can hear an alarm. They'll know they're being called. Um, if it's noisy on board and you're thinking, do they call us? Who are they calling? You will know that you have been called because you'll get an alarm. Um, it frees up emergency channel 16 from ships trying to um, call each other. And it also allows some privacy. So, you know, if I want to call Ian because I've run out of sugar and I don't want the whole fleet to know that, well, I can do that. Um, now, just to explain how this works, I was going to do a live demonstration, but it's much easier to do with YouTube. So I'm going to get um, Sarah from Dorset Marine Training, and she's going to do a little demo for us. OK, so the first one is going to be making a routine DSC call. Just a couple of minutes. Today we're going to have a quick look at how to make a routine call using a digital radio. We're going to use the ICOM M323 radio, but this option will be there on any of your digital radios. You can do the same, whether it's a fixed radio or whether it's a handheld radio. So in this particular case here, we're going to have a quick listen on the channel that we're going to potentially want to talk on to make sure that the channel's clear. So let's have a look at channel 72. There we go, we've gone to channel 72. We've already checked our volume and our squelch on this particular radio. We'll just make sure there's nobody talking on that channel, which there isn't. I'm already on low power here. It says one watt, so that's all clear and ready to go. So to actually send my call, I'm going to go to menu, DSC calls, individual call, because I just want to call one other boat. And I've, here I've got an option. I can either manually input the other person's number, which is their MMSI number, or if I've already got them in my phone book, I've added them, I can just pick them up from the phone book, press enter, choose the channel, and remember I listened to channel 72. There we go. And I'm going to press enter and call. The other radio you can hear in the background would be on another boat. That's calling, so it's quite clear that somebody wants to get to hold of you. They will then acknowledge the call. And our radio now says it's received that acknowledgement. I'm going to press alarm off. And now I can pick up the microphone and just make an ordinary call to the other boat that I want to talk to. It's as simple as that. Just remember, this isn't a private call. Just because we're on channel 72 and have called the other boat, everybody else can still hear us if they're listening to channel 72. It's as simple as that. And then when we finish the call, just go to exit and we're back to where we started. Any queries, let us know. Did everyone understand that? Yeah. Yes, sir. What's the personal number that you say? It's the MMSI number. So it's the same MMSI number that's on your EPIRB and your PLB that's associated with your boat, which makes it very easy. It's your maritime um, um, service identity number. Yeah. Um, Michael's just reminded me, I did have a note of it, <laughs> um, that we're going to be providing you with everyone else's MMSI numbers. So none of this isn't mandatory, but I highly recommend that you enter in everyone's MMSI numbers. It'll take a little while, but it will be worth it. Um, people with the larger radios, like this M323, if someone else in the fleet sends off their distress button, you will see their name, you will see their position, okay, which is... I don't think I need to tell you how valuable that is. Um, but if we don't bring this up and if you don't learn it and you don't understand it, it's, it's completely useless. Um, so I'm just going to do one other quick video and that would be receiving um, the call. So that was uh, Sarah making the call and this is what happens when you receive it. 
Hi, it's Sarah from Dorset Marine Training. We are going to have a quick look in this video at how to receive a digital call on your boat. So in this particular case, you might be sailing along perhaps, your radio's on channel 16, and all of a sudden you hear this come through on your radio. You wouldn't hear that part of it, this is the bit you're just starting to hear now. Your radio starts flashing and it starts making quite a loud noise at you. If we do nothing about it at all, the noise is going to get louder and louder. We can just start to hear it getting a bit louder now. So we have a quick look, we press alarm off, and then we've got three options. We can either ignore the call, we can find out more information, or we can acknowledge the call. And it tells us in the panel here who our call is from. It's from Signet, so I do want to speak to Signet. So I press acknowledge, I'm able to comply, so I press enter, and then I call them back to acknowledge the call. That's the other boat in the background that you can hear. And then from there, what you'll notice is that the radio has changed to the channel that Signet, the boat who is calling us, has chosen. So even though I was on 16, I don't need to choose any other channel, the radio will default automatically to it. And then the other boat will just speak to us as normal, remembering this is an open channel that other people could be listening to. And at the end of the call, we just press exit, and we're back to where we started. Hope that's helpful, but any questions, just give us a call. We'll say Sarah from Dorset Marine Training. Okay. Can I just uh, summarise? Most of us are familiar with the uh, uh, VHF radios, mm -hmm. but we need to understand that uh, this um, the digital circuit you see? is an enhancement which has gradually come into use and it's now widely in use. Mm -hmm. So that, so I noticed when you buy one of these radios, they say, would you like to get one with this new enhancement? And this is what we're talking about, this enhancement. Mm -hmm. so, so by knowing that, that means that you, it's not so shockingly new to you. You've been using the HF radios. We just talked about a specific enhancement which allows us to call designated uh, uh, Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I mean if you're going to buy a VHF radio, as I said, the notice of race uh, says that you will have these, so you do have them. Um, they do have a GPS connected to them, um, so in your case you already will have them. It's free, you have it there, it's just a matter of learning how to use it. Um, we encourage you to use it, we're giving you the MMSI numbers, we want you to get together with each other and start testing. You can do this in the marina, Ian and I, we're doing it during, during the week. It works really well, it's really simple. Um, now, at the start of this, I said that uh, I wanted everyone to approach this with a beginner's mind. Um, in, this is an example of this. Now, I was going to tell you tonight that every single DSC radio is automatically scanning channel 70, the DSC channel. That is not true. I found that out during the week when we were testing. You need to, in some cases, if, if you can't receive DSC calls, it is because your DSC radio is not scanning channel 70 automatically. You need to go into your, there's a special menu, get your manual out, go into that menu, switch on DSC watch, and then test it again. If you don't have DSC watch on, it will not work. You will not, we, we think you will not receive distress calls and you will not receive individual calls. So, very important. Um, so yes, that's DSC. Uh, with all of this stuff, if you're having trouble with it, um, you can get back to us uh, during the week in the lead up to the race and we'll, we'll try and help you out if you're having any trouble. Um, so next one, next page is, um, if I just go back to my presentation. AIS. Um, uh, this is something I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because we time's short, we need to get on to some other issues, but we all, I think we all know what AIS is, we know how important it is. Um, as I said, it's a backup um, for the race, for race control in terms of location, it's collision avoid avoidance. Uh, probably the most important, as Luke was saying, and I'm going to get to it in a minute, is the AIS personal man overboard beacons. Um, so we'll go directly to that now. Okay, so... Um, as Luke said, it was I think it was the second thing he started talking about. Um, race control um, believe this is, you know, possibly one of the most important things a person a person can have. Um, you'll see in the first line here we're saying it's an AIS beacon, but it's DSC as well. So if you if you're not if you're not on DSC watch and you don't know how to use DSC, this is this is of no use. Which is another reason why you need to to get um, get DSC, get a good knowledge of DSC. Um, for this particular MOB1 beacon, 
when that goes off, your AIS um, will alarm, but also your radio will, which is great because if for some reason you can't hear your chart plotter, you, you're going to hear your radio going off. Um, interesting uh, thing about this, these are not currently regulated by AMSA. We found this out um, when we visited with them. Um, but if I just go to the next page, the next page here shows the, the beacon. There's a little picture there of how it works, which I've stolen from uh, MOB1. Um, there is a, a homing beacon, VHF homing beacon, that comes out of these. Um, the information we have from AMSA is that doesn't always get used. Um, sorry, I'm getting, getting ahead, of my else, ahead of myself. The beacon on PLBs doesn't get used, but they do pick up these. So although they don't regulate them, they do use them when they're using, doing search and rescue operations. Um, false alarms, this is really important. You need to know how to turn these off if you accidentally set them off because clearly it's going to cause dramas um, with, the, with the rest of the fleet if they, they see your beacon going off and they, they take action. Um, so you need to turn it off and you need to get on the radio and do a security alert um, to the rest of the fleet or any of the vessels in the area to notify them of that false alarm. Okay, so the PLB, the next one, the, the next uh, personal item, basically uh, it's a baby EPIRB, again works on uh, radio frequency 406 megahertz going up to a satellite, coming back down again. Uh, but it has the 121.5 megahertz frequency for homing. But as I, as I was just saying a moment ago, AMSA uh, search and rescue actually use the AIS uh, man overboard beacon as well, and, and sometimes that can be better. Uh, look, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these again because they're, they're basically, uh, basically an EPIRB, um, which is the next one, the EPIRB. Same thing, 406 megahertz, but it's for your vessel, um, has your MMSI number in it, can be manually activated or automatically um, activated. Uh, and now we come to the YB tracker. So the YB tracker, obviously it's for tracking. Um, interestingly, it uses the uh, Iridium uh, satellites, just like most of your sat phones are going to use. Um, wakes up on a regular basis and it does a... It does a transmission, uh, I think, every 15 minutes, uh, which we receive um, invaluable for race control, for us to know uh, what you're doing, where you are, what your speed is, etc. Um, but this year, we're going to be utilising the messaging function as well as a backup to our SCEDs, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment. HF radio. So, um, HF radio, I think most of us know, uh, know what HF radio is. Um, Something really interesting uh, about this, um, when we were at, um, at the AMSA office uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at um, active um, operations that, uh, that Paul was showing us, and one of them was the um, Antarctic supply vessel Everest, uh, which you may be aware had an engine room fire uh, with 109 people on board, destroyed two, uh, two vessels on board. Their initial contact, their distress call, which was picked up by AMSA, was a HFDSC emergency call. So it just goes to show this, this is not a white elephant, it gets used. Um, in the, we were fortunate enough to be able to see a chain of events that occurred after that um, as a timeline of communications between AMSA and the vessel. and. Um, nothing against satellite, but it just happened to be that the next four or five communications were failed satellite transmissions. Uh, now, it doesn't mean the satellite failed, it might mean no one answered, but the point is that uh, HF is uh, alive and well, it is, uh, it is used in emergency situations, and it is the DSC part of it is ex exactly the same as VHF, it just goes over a much longer distance. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about HF uh, when we come to this get information. Um, so with uh, the race, um, and I'll talk about this in a minute, um, we're not uh, doing SCEDs on HF, I think as most of you know, but we do recognise that people in the fleet do have it. Um, and we feel it's our due diligence to, uh, to at least be able to offer HF in certain situations. So. Um, 
myself as uh, Deputy Race Officer and Principal Race Officer Trevor Milton, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, he sends his apologies. We both have access to a, uh, a 500 watt transmitter at Bibber Lake, which is owned by Barrett Communications, as well as a 150 watt transmitter at Waluna. Um, we have remote access to that over the internet from wherever we are. So if uh, we need to use it, we will. Um, AMSA are aware of that. Um, and they have access to it as well. Okay, so just briefly, GMDSS, so everything uh, that I've shown you up, up until now is part of the GMDSS, or Global Maritime Distress Safety System. Um, it's an it's integral all-over system. You can see the picture there, which links up all of these devices, um, DSC, uh, VHF, um, PLBs, everything is all part of the GMDSS network. Um, I've got a little picture of a book here. This is the GMDS, GMDSS handbook. It's free um, to view at the AMSA website. It is, it is fairly dry reading, but it covers in, in great detail everything that I've talked about tonight. It's a really good idea if you even just have a look through it. Okay, so the last, um, the last item in the communications devices is, is the humble mobile phone. Um, I've left it until now because it's technically not part of uh, the GMDSS network. Um, essentially, like everything else here, it uses radio frequency. Uh, I've, just got, I've just put Telstra's there, um, 700 to 2600 uh, meg. Um, as I was talking about earlier, if you're using um, Iridium Go, you're going to be using your phone to, as the device that will actually uh, be making the calls, etc. So it'd be a good idea to have a, have a backup to that, ready to go, if it goes overboard or gets damaged or whatever. Um, also, um, shouldn't be discounted as a, as a good navigation tool, if, particularly if you have to leave your boat for some reason. Um, if you've got uh, something like Navionics, set up with downloaded maps, you can, you can navigate just with your phone um, if, if everything else is a complete and utter failure, so um, still a very precious device. Um, please have a look at the WA Cruising Guide for more information on the coverage. This, this map I've stolen from there. Um, I hope Kim doesn't mind, I don't know if he's... No, he doesn't mind, he's shaking his head. Um, yep, that's, that's your mobile phone. Okay, so just in review, um, of the devices that we've looked at tonight. We can just get this to come up a little bit. Okay, so we've got a spectrum of devices we can utilise for the event. Um, we've gone through them briefly. I've covered DSC in more detail um, because of the importance of it and the um, AIS MOB beacon. Um, we want, as Luke was saying, his um, comments echo what I'd, I've written here. You need to learn all you can about these devices. You need to know how they work. You need to know how to turn them off. You need to know where to keep them. What to do if they don't work. What is your backup? You need to train your crew on these devices and you need to know when you should use these devices. Um, probably highly important is test your devices. Now I've put their where appropriate because don't test your EPIRB. <laughs> um, test your DSC, get together and do it. It's a good way of meeting people. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically, you know, some people think these, these devices are all very different. They're actually not. They're all, they're all similar. They are all sort of from the same family of communications that use uh, radio waves. Um, they're all part of the radio spectrum. And I'll just put this next slide in, which, you know, you can't normally see radio waves, but you can actually see them with this chart. So this is the Australian radio frequency spectrum, and I'm just uh, what I've done is I've overlaid onto it the devices we've talked about tonight, just to sort of put them in perspective. So you've got your very low frequencies up in the top left-hand corner, and then you've got your very high frequencies in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, um, up around um, 3,000 gigs. So if we look at the first one, we've got our HF radio. Opera takes up that big section in the middle there. That's the that's the HF radio frequencies. If we add in our VHF devices, we've got our VHF radio, we've got our AIS, and we've got our AIS MOB beacon, 156 to 162 meg. We've got our satellite phones, they're using radio frequency as well, much higher again. 
uh, as well as your YB tracker in the blue area down the bottom there. We've got our EPIRBs and our PLVs at, um, everything okay? <laughs> um, too excited? Too excited? Yeah. I'll have, to, I'll have to calm it down a bit. Um, and then finally we've got our mobile phone down the bottom. So that, that's how it all fits together in the, um, in the radio frequency spectrum. So now, is there any, anyone got any questions before we move on? Yeah, quick question. You mentioned West Australian Cruising Guides, uh, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little pamphlet on the front desk there which says, uh, uh, now available online for free. What, what have you, have they, I mean, I can go literally online and get yep. the Absolutely. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, okay. yeah, it's a bestseller. And the author is sitting over there. He'll sign a copy for you. <laughs> yeah, it really is excellent. I, I think um, we're advising people have certain chapters of it on board. So go and download it, read it. Um, you know, massive amount of work in there by Kim and other contributors. Um, it's a great read. Um, I would read it, all of those chapters before you leave. What was the question? Sorry? What was the question? What was the question that you gave? The, the, my question? No, the question. The question. Is oh, so I'm sorry. The gentleman was asking about whether the um, cruising guide was free to download, which it is. In, in fact, I think we'll get Tor to send uh, send the link out to that. Two, two formats. Two formats. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There's uh, EPUB, EPUB, and uh, Acrobat. Okay. So let's get on to. It takes a minute to warm up, right? Minute to warm up. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Just, just one, one thing to, to um, remind uh, sailors about that the repeater network is not part of the GMDSS system, and uh, as such, even if you're in range of a repeater and you go to trigger a repeater and you don't get a tail coming back, it may be that the repeater is down. Correct. Yeah. So you won't be able to talk to anyone on that repeater channel because you are talking on a duplex system but the repeater system may be down so if you don't get a response in the tail go to channel 16 or go to channel 67 and try to initiate the call that way yep that's absolutely correct and thanks mike correct that's right yeah yeah as mike said unless you get that tail it's just not going to work so don't waste your time trying to call people okay so um just uh, on the skeds now, so you've all um, received the preliminary copy of the um, sailing instructions today. I'm going to go through these one by one. I think I think we have time. I've got a question up the back. Just a quick question. After the hurricane that just came down from the northwest, are all the repeater stations functional and do they have power? We're doing our best to find that out. Uh, Mike, who was just on the microphone then, has contacts at the water police and the and I think it's. Visa, or DFES, sorry, who actually operate those systems. We're, we're endeavouring to find out um, if those repeaters are working. If we find out that they're not, we, we will let you know. Most of the race will give you a status of what systems are about. Calvary is down at the Calvary is down, is it? Okay, thanks very much. Well, we'll, we'll have a look into that. And um, as I said, as, and as Mike said, we'll... Uh, We'll make sure that we can take, give you as much information on that as we can before you leave. Yes, sir. Just bear with me. You want to We're going up the coast. Mm -hmm. We've got the radio on dual watch, channel yep. 16, and race control. Uh, we're going up the coast. We have the radio on dual watch, channel 16. And is a race control on channel 72? And will we be on channel 72? Or do we need to go to a repeater station? Race control will not be using VHF radio because you'll be out of range. Once you, once you leave Perth, um, VHF does not have the range to enable race control to be able to talk to you. The only, the only use um, you're going to be able to use VHF for until you get to Exmouth is to talk to each other, to get weather, to talk to any coast stations or the water police if you know, if that needed to happen. So race control are not going to be talking to you via VHF radio 
when you're not in the local area here, or um, but, but they will once you get to Axe So your dual watch will be channel 16 and whatever the repeater station number is? Correct, but dual watch is only two stations. So um, as I was saying at the start, you need to be scanning. You need to be scanning channels. So for example, if you were near Rat Island and there's three repeaters there, plus 16, that's four channels. So you need to set up your radio to scan those four channels. If the, if the race, I'm sorry, 7-2 as well, because we're, that is still a designated race channel, but it's just not going to be used by race control when you're out of range. So you might get um, someone in the fleet might try and call the whole fleet for some reason, and they'll probably do it on 7-2. So in, in that example, near Rat Island, 16, 7-2, 80, 81, and I think it was 22. So you, it's about knowing where you are and what repeaters are, are around you and, and the other two channels to be on. Does that make sense? And the VHF radio does that scan all those channels. Yes. Yep, so get your manual out. Um, if you've got a um, ICOM VHF, uh, there's a button that says tag. Um, if you go to a channel and you hold down that button, it will tag that channel to be scanned. If you come to some channel like say 77 that you're not using and it says tag and you hold down that button, it will remove the tag. Just if you try that on your radio, um, you'll, you'll work that out. If, if you're having problems with it though, let us know and we'll give you a hand to sort that out. It is very important. Thank you. Um, a week or two ago, I heard somebody say around the club that um, in, in the past, uh, many, many boats have uh, uh, HF radio, but from this race, uh, we're, we're not even formally listening to a HF radio. Uh, other government agencies might be, uh, rescue, rescue bodies, but, but the club as such isn't, isn't listening out for, isn't responsible for. Can we use the microphone? We can't hear it. can't hear a word you're saying. Uh, what, what, what I'm asking is The gentleman's the... just uh, clarifying that, um, that the um, race control are not using HF radio for, uh, as a listening watch or for skeds, and that is correct. Um, I'm going to, the section I'm going into now, which will be our last section, I'm going to explain um, how that's going to work. Okay, so um, the skeds. So 1.1, all race yachts are required to send a text message via satellite phone or mobile phone at 9, uh, 0900 hours, 9am, plus or minus 10 minutes, uh, and 2100 hours, 9pm, plus or minus 10 minutes every day for the duration of the event. Now we've We've put the um, plus or minus in there just because we just don't want to get bombarded um, by texts all at one time, and also so that you don't think you have to do it exactly at that time. Um, the rally yachts, the same, uh, same situation at 1.2, except the time is different. It's um, 0, 0800 hours and um, 20, 100 hours, 8 p.m. Again, plus or minus 10 minutes, that just breaks up. Um, the skeds so that we have time to deal with all the messages. Okay, so 1.3, the text message from the yachts shall be the following sample format, boat A, OK. So we've made this as simple as we, po as we possibly can because we know that you're texting. Uh, you'll send that to the primary sked mobile phone number which is 0411862234. Race control will reply with boat A logged. It's just that simple. So when you get that message back, you, you know that your, um, your initial message has been received. Um, in the unlikely situation that that phone number becomes unavailable, destroyed, broken, whatever, we will be doing a, um, a text message to all of you to notify you of a new number if that occurs, as unlikely as it, as it is going to be. Okay, so 1.5, this is where your options start if you're having problems um, with your sat phone. Uh, should yachts not be able to make contact with race control um, for a sked by satellite or mobile phone, uh, the, next, um, the next thing that you can try is your YB tracker. Um, as I alluded to before, we're going to be using or setting up messaging for YB trackers. Uh, there'll be some instructions for that. And that is your backup. Um, if you can't get through uh, with your satellite phone. So we'll see that um, through the YB Tracker interface and uh, we'll be able to take your sked that way and we'll reply to it. Uh, 1.6, should you not be able to make contact through your satellite phone or through your YB Tracker, um, if you have data available on your sat phone, you can send an email to fscxmouth.gmail.com. Um, that's a 
email address we have set up and we have access to, so we'll, we'll do it that way if we need to. Um, should you not be able to make contact through any of those means, uh, 1.1 through to 1.6, you need to do a relay uh, message via VHF uh, from another boat who hopefully has uh, comms available and they can do that for you. Um, so you're going to have to get in touch with those, those other boats to relay your SCED message uh, and the format is there. Um, so it is uh, the relay yacht shall send the message in the following sample format: relay boat relay via boat A, boat B is okay. Race control will reply boat B logged, and then that relay vessel can then get back to the originating vessel and let them know. Um, this mobile phone number and this system, which I'll explain how we're doing it in a minute, is going to be ready uh, probably Monday or Tuesday next week. You'll receive an email from Tor to uh, make you aware of that and you can start testing um, just during the day, please. If you could uh, send your text messages through from your sat phone to that number and I will reply to them um, to make sure that's all working and you need to uh, get in touch with us if there's any problems. Okay, so the next slide, actually I didn't have that slide up on the screen there, but sorry about that. Okay, so this is responding to and recording SCEDs by race control. So this is what we're doing at our end. Uh, 1.8, race control acknowledged that some yachts might at times have difficulty getting their SCED messages through. Um, as such, race control will accept messages outside, but as close as possible to the times detailed at 8.1, um, without penalty for the race yachts. Race control will endeavour to do everything possible to assist inside and outside of the prescribed SCED types. The overall objective of this is that race control achieves and maintains regular contact with the yachts and vice versa. That is why we are doing this. So race control, as an overview, uh, will use text, messaging, man text message management software as the primary means of managing the SCED messages from all yachts. Uh, once the text messages are received, they'll be acknowledged as above. Uh, the YB tracker interface will also uh, be monitored for positions. Um, so what that means is that when we receive your, um, your SCED message, we take your position from uh, Yellow Brick and we apply that to a live spreadsheet for every communication you make. What this does is it saves you having to text GPS coordinates to us which would be a real pain for you. Um, you know where you are, we know where you are, so it's much easier for us to do it. So that all is recorded in a live uh, Excel document, which is backed up, as is the text messages, which are also backed up to a, a single source cloud. Um, and incidentally, all of that information is available to AMP, so they've asked if they can get, have access to that, and they can, so they can look up um, our Excel spreadsheet with all your details in it if they need it in an SAR context um, as they can with the text messages. Um, is that clear? Does anyone question, have any questions there? Yes sir, up the back. Mike, sorry, you better go up the back there. Um, if uh, you don't get a sked from someone, have you allocated a specific time that all yachts are uh, watching whatever the text message is from you to say, uh, boat close to you, please contact them, confirm something? Is there a specific time of day that you're going to do that? There, there, there isn't, um, but basically um, how this is going to work is that uh, myself, um, as a deputy race officer, I will be... Uh, managing all the nine, all the all the morning texts, and then uh, Principal Race Officer Trevor will be doing all the evening tech, evening uh, scares. So what will happen is, as all the as they all come through, and I'm marking them, or entering the data into the spreadsheet, and I find that there's uh, boats missing, I will then go back to those boats. Uh, we will we will text that boat. We will use YB Tracker to contact that boat. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Um, we will do everything we can to get back in contact with that boat, uh, even if it does mean texting another boat who we can see is near you so that you can call, that boat can call on the radio. So if it ends up at the end of the text, there's three boats that we just can't get comms with, we will just spend however long it takes to, to get that information. 
so that we can get it into our spreadsheet. So there's no time limit on that. Ideally, we would like to get that done as quickly as possible. Um, but that is, that is what we'll be doing. Um, which brings me to the next slide, which is race control methods um, to come. Sorry, can I just jump in? Um, yep. If you've used every option you can to report your position via SCED, would it be acceptable if you radio or, or satellite called the race office that reporting your position? Yes, it would. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'm going to. That's another thing I'm going to get to, but I'll talk about it now. So in the in the front of your um, sailing instructions. The phone number's there for myself and for Trevor and for Tor. Um, you can also call the, num the SCED number, but we prefer you didn't because we just want to keep that clear for the text messages. So if, yeah, if that's a situation, if it's gone to half an hour and we're not getting contact and you want to try and call either myself or Trevor, that's totally okay. That's, what, um, that's one of the reasons those numbers are on that sheet. Joe. And the, the Illegium goal, it's got a tracking facility in there which can be automated to send the, the positions and everything, but unfortunately it sends it only directly to an email address. Is that suitable for this? It sends it to uh, an email address? To an email address, oh, yes. That would be suitable if it is your last resort, yes. But not in the first instance? No, no in message. the first instance we, we want it to be a text message. Uh, the reason for that is we're, we're trying to streamline it, make it as easy as we can for people, but the primary objective is we maintain contact via satellite phone, and, and that's why we, we want to do it that way. If you, if you can't get through on satellite and that is the only option you have, then, then yes, do that. Because that tracking facility provides you straight away with the position of the yeah, it, yeah, that's, that's right, um, but we, we don't want to use that as an overall all solution. We prefer to do it this way, uh, minimising the amount of um, texting and, and characters that people need to put in. And, and that would be because it really even goes emergency uh, button isn't designed to interact with us, it's uh, an international feature, isn't it? It, it, it really even go has a, a red emergency mm -hmm. button. Your no, 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 not the emergency. It's got a tracking facility. Okay which you can set up that it sends yeah. frequent, frequent tracks okay. with each week yeah. email mm -hmm. the position of the bot similar than NYB. The other reason, Joe, is that not everyone's going to have Iridium Go. Yeah, yeah. So we, we're trying to get as much continuity as we can uh, through the system. Okay, so race control methods to contact yachts, 3.1, satellite text. Race control will use satellite phone text messages as the primary form of communications. Race control may call yachts via satellite voice if required, which answers the gentleman's question before. Uh, satellite group text, race control will set up text messaging groups for messages to go to the entire fleet from the primary scared or secondary scared race control mobile phone numbers if necessary. Sending a group text might be, for example, to update of a change to the scared phone number or it might be a weather alert or something of that nature. Uh, yachts must acknowledge with a reply message in the following sample format, boat A received. We're not anticipating we're going to need to do this, uh, but it may occur, so we've made provision for it. Um, 3.1, satellite voice. Race control may use satellite voice uh, calls if necessary. YB Tracker, 3.3, YB Tracker messaging, race control may use YB Tracker messaging during the event to contact yachts. 3.4, mobile phone, race control may use mobile phone voice and text messaging during the event if you're in range. Email, race control may use fscxmouth at gmail.com uh, to contact yachts if necessary, and HF radio. So, Race control will not be monitor monitoring but may use HF radio to communicate what with yachts during the event. ROs will have remote access to the Barrett Communications base stations at Bibber Lake and Waluna. Race control will confirm which yachts have working HF radio. Um, yachts with HF radio, if you could just come and see me afterwards. If, you, if you're interested and you want us to have your details, come and see me afterwards so we can get those details from you. Um, marine HF radio. Race control may use marine uh, VHF radio if within range to contact yachts as necessary, which is uh, a, a secondary answer to the gentleman's question before. 3.8, AMSA, WA Water Police and or VMR groups, although unlikely, may use any of the above me methods to contact yachts during the event if necessary. They, as I said before, they have all of your information, everything, satellite phones, the whole lot. 
is all uh, held um, by, ad, by ad, so given to them uh, by us. Uh, any questions about the SCEDs or the communications? Mike up the back there. I just want to point out that if you do set off an EPIRB, Amson may call you straight away on your mm. satellite phone. So be aware of that. You may get a call very quickly from Amson on your satellite phone. So yeah, that's that's the plan. Um, as I said, AMSA have gone through it. They've uh, they've endorsed it. We feel um, it covers all bases. Um, it's different to what we've done before. It's definitely the first race in Western Australia to be run entirely or primarily on uh, satellite phone. Um, could be the first one uh, in Australia. Um, so just the last page, um, and this is this is really key actions pre -depa pre departure. If I could just again. Um, say to please go through this book. If you know everything about this, that's fine. If you don't, please brush up on what you don't know. Use this as your reference. Give it to your crew. Get your crew to read it. Uh, the more people know about this, the better. Practice your DSC and think very seriously about getting an AIS MOB beacon if you don't have it. Um, there will be a skipper's risk register, which is part of the risk assessment document coming out. Uh, next week, um, Tor will be sending it that out, and that's going to be uh, be uh, valuable in terms of information of things that that uh, are key risks and that you need to to address. Yep, another question up the back there, Anita. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, if your if the details of your PLB etc. need to be current with the boat that you're actually sailing on, as opposed to one that you normally sail on. Oh, um, Mark Wheeler Camp. Yeah, Mark. Um, uh, uh, congratulations on the amount of information that's there. <coughs> Thank Might you. Might be a bit of a curse. <laughs> um, it is. So I'd, I'd certainly. Um, suggest that there be a simplified version for simple people like myself. Um, because all of this information during a race will be um, pretty hard to digest. Yeah, okay, that actually is something I was just about to bring up. Um, we're going to be creating a, a basically what we're calling a cheat sheet for you, uh, which will be a laminated document. It's going to have the very basics of this. It's going to have all the primary phone numbers. It's going to have the MMSIs. Um, it's going to have everything in there that we think is valuable for you to look at very, very quickly uh, if you need it. Um, and that will be coming out in, in the next uh, week or so. Yeah. Um, and just one of the, and I don't have an answer, um, this is a sort of a what if, is that typically um, SCEDs over VHF, uh, you, you get sort of immediate feedback. Now, um, it, it, it's a remote possibility, but you, you send 10 minutes early, you get no response by 10 minutes after. Um, uh, n now you go to plan B, you're going to be well outside the time limit, and as my learned colleague here, Mr Hughes, asked, um, how many... S so, then, then, then you go to plan B and plan C, and, and we've had recently where the YB tracker wasn't working, so you kind of um, now going down the hierarchy of, of uh, comms methods, methods yeah. um, and the, 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 the benefit of VHF is that everyone hears, um, you know, missed, missed uh, scared, did anyone hear, that sort of thing. So there's a, there's a bit of a um, contingency plan for, because you'll be well outside the time limit, the penalties, um, Skids, et cetera, et cetera, for the race fleet, for the, for the race fleet yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's why we're not uh, having any penalties for, for relating to skids for this race. There you go, wheels, that's easy. Problem solved. Does that mean we don't have to go on skids? No, you have to do the skids. <laughs> you have to do the skids, you will do the skids. <laughs> Uh, sorry, we're still working on the penalties. You'll see there's a TBA on the penalty section to work out exactly what the regime will be because clearly 
you know, if people have got genuine technical difficulties, fine, fair enough. But as Cam said, it's so important to maintain contact with race control. So uh, we do want people to take it seriously. Thanks. We know that you're going to do your absolute best to try and get in contact with us. Uh, if, if I'm still trying to make contact with you at 11 or 12 o'clock um, from your morning skid to maintain contact, that's what I'll be doing. Look, it, it may sound like I'm stating the bleeding obvious, but I would strongly urge all the skippers to ensure that at least half your crew have a completely working knowledge of how the communication systems work. Because uh, if, if someone is to, to become incapacitated, um, quite a few people need to know how to do this because that, that will be a problem otherwise. Okay, so if there's no further questions, that's it from me. Um, as I said, if you're having troubles, um, get in touch uh, with the sailing office. We'll do everything we can to, uh, to assist you before the race starts. I've actually got a, a boat, um, Green, doing its um, passage from Albany uh, to Perth starting in the next few days. They're going to be using this system. We'll be trialling it um, exactly how you will be. So if there is any issues, we'll be able to uncover those. Um, we've also got uh, a few boats leaving early on the Wednesday, we'll be doing it with them as well. So by the time the main fleet um, leaves, um, this, this should all be locked away. Thank you. Oh, one more question from Bernie. Uh, that's correct, yeah, thanks Bernie. Bernie's going to be uh, have his mobile HF um, station at Exmouth, so he's going to be monitoring as well. Um, HF people, if you come and see me afterwards, I'll give you all the information you need. But it'll be the standard offshore uh, frequencies, 4227, I think, and sorry, 6227 and 4146. But yeah, HF people, come and see me afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Cam. It's um, a lot of information, but if you drill down, it's, the system's pretty simple. It's uh, sending a text, um, it's not and receiving a text. And because we've got so many, so many backups, um, I guess that's what makes it sound really complicated. But again, you can see the amount of work that Cam, um, Mike up the back there, Ian have done preparing this documentation, preparing the, uh, the systems. Um, Taken a while to bring it bring it to the fore because it's been months in preparation. So we, we think we've got everything covered. Um, we hope we've got everything covered, but it is still a work in progress. And we've got to appreciate that this is the first time that's been used in Australia to just just have sat phone and with as a primary primary comms. So we need to work with it a little bit, um, and we're pretty sure it'll work. I'm sure we all know it will work. It's. Uh, so we've got to give them time to work out the uh, any curly ones. Um, Cam, we've got a, a, a little present for you there. Just for all Cam's efforts. And we've got another one here for Ian. Just um, for this for this event, we've actually we've got a PRO being Trevor, we've got RO in Perth, Cam, and an RO in uh, Exmouth being Bernie. Um, and as Cam said, Bernie will have all of his radio paraphernalia up there. He'll also be getting be in the loop as far as the uh, position reports go. So we're covered from a lot of directions. Um, yeah, and, and Bernie will be there to. To greet us with a card of beer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's all. How are we? Good, mate. I'm having trouble loading up some of my documents.